Welcome to the uh, HPC Best Practices webinar series. This series is brought to you by the IDEAS Productivity Project, which is part of the Exascale Computing Project of the United States Department of Energy. The series is a collaboration involving the computing facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marquez from Lawrence Berkeley Lab, and will be the host for today's webinar Acquisition and Analysis of Time Series of Satellite Data in the Cloud, Lessons from the Field. The webinar will be presented by Marisol Garcia Reyes. Marisol is a scientist at the Farallon Institute in California. She has a background in physics, atmospheric science, and computer sciences, but she's a, an uh, oceanographer at heart. Her research focuses on climate and on how climate change and the variability impact marine environments and ecosystems and on climate uh, extreme events. This research requires the analysis of large amounts of diverse data in her own research and in collaborative research as well. And this has motivated Marisol to learn and to share her experiences and expertise on new data and coding advances. We'll be receiving questions through the Zoom chat and also the Google Doc. I'll paste the, 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 that address in the chat momentarily. Uh, we have asked Marisol to add breaks during this, uh, her presentation so she can respond to the questions that come in. And with that, Marisol, I'll stop my sharing here and please. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. There. sharing now. Uh, thank you for joining us and thank you for that introduction, Asni. Um, first of all, let me thank the Better Scientific Software Organization for giving me a grant to do this tutorial that I'm going to talk about today and to my colleagues at Farallon Institute who have been very, very patient and listening to me talking about Python and data in the cloud, non stopping pretty much. Um, so just to what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk about the motivation for doing these tutorials, and then I'll, I'll describe relatively briefly the tutorial itself, and then I'll jump into what are the lessons learned that are hopefully the most interest for this group. Um, so in terms of motivation, um, first of all, uh, it's about open science. I think that this is not a new concept, but it has gained popularity in the last years, and it's definitely taken um, a hold in many, many aspects of science. But personally, I think that it goes beyond that sharing your data methods code um, to the wider community or put in the internet or where your publications. I really think that to make it really open, it should be accessible, especially to accessible to people that do not have access to it, that being because of limited resources, um, or because they do not have the expertise to fully understand all the jargon and all the difficulties of your work. Meaning people that are in different fields or they're just not expert in whatever you are presenting. I truly think that um, advances and innovation in science can only go um, grow coming from this diversity of ideas and new collaborations outside of our um, groups of expertise. Um, therefore, um, um, one part that I'm interested in is because all the data now, it's going into the cloud, or well, not all the data, but a lot of the data, and it's being phased out. A lot of the data that is produced from satellite models, et cetera, et cetera, are being migrated into the clouds. And also cloud computing is becoming more and more accessible and more like a norm. I really think that that's great for the advancement of open science, but it really needs to be accessible. Um, partially in, in resource, as I say, but also to non-experts, which are still feeling a little bit or a lot intimidated by the prospect of having to migrate or getting everything from the cloud. So what I'm trying to do, my motivation is to try to make this, um, these ideas of open science, in particular your code and data, um, more accessible and one time series at a time. Of course, that's kind of the overall uh, motivation, but there's a particular scientific motivation for these tutorials. And that's obviously related to what I do, which is climate, um, climate impacts in marine science or in earth sciences. And the motivation comes from 
the fact that there's a lot of satellite data and there is a lot of great and very user-friendly interfaces to acquire and plot um, images or short time series of satellite data or satellite based data. And here there are two examples. One is this map of a marine heat wave that occurred in the Northern Pacific in, um, well, it was technically from 2013 to 2016, but this image is of May 2015. Um, and then there is this time series of daily um, sea surface temperature for two or three years during this time um, period of the marine heat wave in Northern California. This type of time series are more or less easy to get, more or less, but the images are really easy. You, there are so many different um, engines um, that you can get a beautiful image of the region that you're interested in. Um, but with uh, with time, now that the satellite era is in is very mature, uh, we have a lot of data now in time. We have around four decades of data for the longest living um, acquisition of data from a big range of satellites, and we have many um, models that take to take those data and make it into a, a fully graded non gap data sets called reanalysis or level three or four um, satellite data that are great for climate studies because what we want is long time series. Um, so for example, in climate research, um, let's say like we want to calculate how much this temperature of the ocean, sea surface temperature has changed through the decades. And I mean, in this case, I'm showing two things. One, a time series that obviously is not coming from, oh no, sorry, I, I was just reading wrongly. Um, it's coming from satellite data in general. Uh, so we have data from the 80s to 2020, and you can see the warming trend. And also you can see the image, which require that for each location for the globe, you calculate a trend over that time series. Um, so for doing this kind of research globally or for a small region of view, it requires a lot of um, computing, computing expertise, right? To be able to get the data, to be able to analyze it and display it in, in beautiful ways. But now satellite data allows to have this long time series to do such analysis. In particularly the kind of analysis that I do, um, and this is applied to the field of eco marine ecosystem research, uh, but it's just an example of how it can be extended to other fields, is, is this. We are looking for how the marine ecosystem, and in this case in particular anchovies, uh, are, influenced, are influenced by the conditions in the ocean because we want to know how they're going to change with climate change, for example. So in the graphic that I'm presenting here, uh, in the y-axis, we have our biological indicator, whatever might this be. In this case, it's ancho anchovy larvae, but it could be uh, growth of a certain organisms, expansion, uh, age, you name it. In the x-axis, we have some climate indicators. In this case, I'm, I'm displaying the upwelling index, but it could be anything. It could be temperature, it could be salinity, it could be... Um, um, I don't know, chlorophyll, you name it. And what we want is a relationship that in, I mean, I'm, I'm showing obviously a very big one that shows that there's a relationship between the upwelling index and the anchovy. And that relationship when it's really tight allows to um, predict what's gonna happen when we have certain conditions or when you know that the ocean conditions can change in the future. So that's kind of what we want. However, uh, not everywhere there's a lot of data to do this for this kind of analysis when you want them to be statistically significant, um, you need a lot of data. You need decades of data if possible. Um, and that's not always possible, not just with the biological indicators, but particularly with the physical indicators because not everywhere um, there's either the possibility or the budget to do in situ um, analysis or, or uh, field trips or put buoys, whatever. Um, and so this is where the satellite data has a lot of potential to fill this gap, right? To do um, analysis in places when there's not a lot of in-situ data, but also in places when there's just one point of physical data, let's say from a buoy, and now we can have more regional uh, data around it to understand more mechanisms or just 
uh, details of what we're observing. So this is what we want, and um, this can be applied to many different fields. But the problem is, um, is that for analyzing time series, this long time series that now they are very pretty, it's if you want to go to the region, historically, the data is stored as an image for a time step, being that a day, a week, a month. So you have a big file that is kind of a global image or a regional image, and you have to go and open that file, select your region, select, uh, save that, that data for that time step, and then go do the same for the next file and the next file. Um, before what we need to do, and, and in some cases still we have to do now, is get that file downloaded into our computer and do that process for each of them. And if you are thinking of doing daily data for three decades, you can imagine how much um, input output that creates and also how much storage you have to do. Let's say you get a region, you finally do it, and then you decide you need to do it again because you want to extend your region a little bit more. So on one side, that requires a lot of um, resources, physical hardware resources, but on the other side, it requires a lot of expertise that a lot of the people in other fields, let's say in marine ecosystems that I'm talking about, they don't necessarily have the expertise in computing, not just in coding, but in computing in general, to be able to do this um, in a time that is efficient or justifiable for their research. Um, luckily, there's a lot of new tools now that allow this analysis to be much, much faster, right? We have programming languages that are much um, advanced and easy to use and utilities and libraries like X-Ray that are like magical for this kind of work. Uh, we also have resources uh, or tools to help us make this computing a little bit faster or a little bit uh, less limited in our hardware in our workspace, like a binder, um, which is like an environment that is running online or in the cloud that you can access through the internet or Jupyter, Hub, uh, Jupyter Labs um, or Jupyter Notebooks that allow you to have your scripts in a much more interactive and intuitive way. And also we have now the new formats of data and data that is stored in the cloud and it's increasingly moving to the cloud that allows to acquire that data in a faster, more efficient, way that doesn't require all, us downloading every single file that we find. Uh, but um, getting to these tools and knowing what they are and how what they can do for us um, requires a lot of knowledge um, on computer, like where to start, where to get the data. Like there's a lot of information online, but where do we start looking, discerning what information is the new one or the one that is relevant can be not just difficult, but also intimidating and discouraging for new people that want to use this data. And that's where my motivation um, for doing this tutorial really comes from. I really want to do a little bit of a tutorial that is self-taught that can provide an overview of what these new technologies can do to be able to use satellite and satellite-based data but mainly by passing um, some of the struggles that, um, that will be very discouraging. And some of those are installing and updating Python and the libraries. Um, how to bypass the beginning so you can see the cool stuff and see if it's useful for you or not, uh, where to get the data and how to get the data, which is more important. So that's what I, um, I propose to do. And well, that's what I did. So this is, um, just a tutorial, but just to, um, I'll talk about it in a second, but um, just to reiterate, like my audience or my target audience for this tutorial, is really um, scientists that have limited expertise in satellite data and computing, right? Like they, I realize, and you, I will talk about this later, is that we do need some coding expertise, but very limited. And um, really I want to present how to use satellite data for whatever research that you might I want to use it. Uh, the other uh, target audience is limited resources when you don't have a fast internet or a lot of storage or a lot of computer power, but there's still tools in the cloud that allow you to do this um, analysis without these resources. And also, I mean, for people that just need an update that they are um, 
they do use satellite data that they do no programming, but they don't use cloud or the new technologies like Python and X-Ray so they can learn about the new tools. Um, so let me just talk about the tutorial uh, very quickly, um, but I hope that you guys um, feel uh, curious and go and see it for yourself. So it's, it's hosted in GitHub um, and there's a very thorough description of what it is and what are these motivations that I've talked about, but more importantly, it can be run in the cloud so you don't have to install anything. And how it works is that, as I say, they are hosted in GitHub, but you can run it two ways. You can use it, you can run it in your computer, you can download it, clone your, your GitHub repository and run it from there. However, um, you can also um, run it in, the, um, in a cloud binder. This is a, a link that is going to create an environment in the in the cloud, and so you access it through the internet, and it's going to run everything in there. It already has the Python environment and all the libraries that you need, so you bypass the whole installation, and then it's going to get satellite data and satellite-based data from the cloud. I'm choosing to use Amazon Web Services because the, some of the stored data there is more conducive, at least when I started, to um, time series analysis. Um, I'll, I'll share the link in a second. Um, oh, thank you, hey Anne. Um, let me just describe very quickly what it, how it's um, divided. There's a first a set of intro introductory chapters, which are presenting the basics of Python and the basics of X-Ray, because those are the tools that we're gonna use. Is by no means a Python tutorial per se. Like there are many resources for that. And really what I want to give you is a taste of what Python and X-Ray can do for, for us. But um, also I need to present the basic commands and concepts that are needed to understand um, the core of this tutorial, which are um, the example chapters. So this is, this is really the goal. There are three chapters that I divided in three types of satellite data that you can get. All of this is air data. However, um, I mean, obviously I choose air data because that's my expertise, but this can be expanded to other types of data. Um, hopefully with time, it will be a little bit more standard, but, but I'll talk about that later. Um, so these are three examples, ocean data, atmospheric data, and land data. And they are um, from, data that is directly a uh, satellite, right? Uh, like the sea surface temperature or satellite based data, which has really a reanalysis. I say it's a model that takes the satellite data and fill the gaps and uh, make it more standard everywhere in the world. Um, it's kind of already uh, quality control as well. I do that and there are two sources. One is the cloud, which is what I intended originally. That was my first goal, but there are also some data that is online because not all the data is yet available in the cloud. And the goal is to do a simple analysis in each of these chapter on that time of series that we acquire from the cloud or the internet, just to give a taste of what you can do. Um, so, sorry, this is, this is later than the question, but this is the link. Um, it's in my personal GitHub for, for now. And I'm just going to give you a very quick um, tour. So I'll uh, share another, um, give me one second. Here we go. So this is the, uh, the GitHub repository and you can access from here. You can see all the scripts in here, all the chapters. As I say, there's a description of the objective, all the motivation that I talk about, but most importantly, there is this, um, this button here, launch binder, which actually, if you click on it, uh, it will open um, an environment in the cloud, in this case, hosted by mybandit.org, that is going to load all the environment that you need to be able to run the tutorials and go over them on your own. Um, that's, that's the, the best way to do it. Of course, I say you can clone it, but um, because it takes a minute to load, I'm just going to go into, this is in my computer, this is what will happen if you clone it in your computer and you'll be able to see and access every, um, every chapter. 
every chapter is divided in, in two parts or maybe three parts. Uh, some of it is the text that it explains everything. There are some commands and then at the end, uh, there's uh, um, resources. So if you want to learn more and to give, get more specifics about things, um, there's a lot of resources. And I'm just gonna show you, for example, one of the, um, the scripts that are with commands. So I give a lot of text, but then I give commands that you can run and modify while you're working through the tutorial. Um, I try to comment everything. Sometimes there's a lot of comments, but that's just to understand. So uh, what it's doing for people that are not expert on coding. And so they can really understand what we're doing and what's happening in each of the plots. So in few, um, in few of the chapters, I try to get you from having the basics of coding to all the way to be able to understand the examples which um, look like this and be able to acquire data from the internet um, or from the cloud and do your own analysis and they are customizable. customizable. So I recommend that you um, go and take a look and play with it if possible. I would love some feedback from anybody that um, takes a look at it. And let me now go back to the presentation. Uh, but let me um, stop here and ask questions um, if, if there's questions so far uh, before I jump into the lesson, lessons learned while making these tutorials. Uh, not yet, Marisol, please continue. Okay, perfect. So, um, so my goal today is not to talk about the tutorials in detail. So again, please go and take a look on your own. Um, I, ho I hope that is useful. Um, however, part of this grant, and just because I wanted also feedback uh, from people, I taught these tutorials um, four times to different audiences. Um, and this is where my collaborators or and my, my work group comes in handy because they hear it also many, many times. Um, and so I, I, that's part of what I want to present today. Um, but first of all, let me, let me give you um, kind of the disclaimer <laughs> in a way. This is a personal perspective. I'm not an expert on technology or coding. That's not, uh, despite the fact that I have some background in computer science, that's not what I do. I'm not a computer scientist. I'm really a user. Right, I do, I'm an oceanographer. I work with um, marine ecologists in doing marine research. So I'm really, um, given my expertise in computer science, um, I'm really just one step removed user from my target audience, which um, I'm thinking is people that have a little bit of a more average or limited um, coding experience for other fields that are not computer science. So say that I will talk about what I learned through making this these tutorials and teach these tutorials. So I'm going to start with the teaching the tutorials because that's easy and fast. Um, that um, something that I learned is that really analyzing time series is a challenge in its own. To me, time series seems like the most um, I don't know easy uh, way I guess to do an analysis. However. Um, it is not so when you're dealing with satellite data. As I say, the, the acquiring the data from a from an image is it requires a lot of computing expertise, but also it requires some certain thinking because not all the data is gap free or it's available everywhere. Um, so it's it's a thing on its own and it has its challenges. Uh, however, a lot of the analysis end up being time series regardless, even for spatial explicit analysis. Um, generalizations are not that simple, um, but not because the concept behind analyzing time series is not simple or cannot be applied to other fields, but it's because many fields have different types of data. And, um, and I'm hoping that eventually we're going to land in data formats that are a little bit more consistent through fields so we can actually share what we learn to each other. Um, I realized that jumping into the concepts of um, Python and X-Ray and how to get the data, it really requires some coding expertise, at least some of the abstraction that you learn when you learn to code, even if you don't know any Python. Um, 
And the people that found these tutorials more useful is people that actually try before to analyze some satellite data and realize that it was really complicated and difficult. So at least they have the idea that they can use it. I found that those people in the tutorials, they were the most like, this is exactly what I was looking for. Um, and they keep asking questions about how, um, how to customize it for their own research, where I thought it was, it was really, really um, um, rewarding that somebody found it, found it useful. And now making the tutorials, and this is where um, what I hope that I, I get some questions and some opinions as here as well. Uh, this is again just my opinion on what I found while doing this. And I found three different types of challenge, right? Right? Is the data itself, then the software, and then putting it all together, um, it deserves its bullet point in its own. First, the data, and this is, I think, more pervasive for every field, but also for everybody and a lot of the challenges that we're facing right now with uh, this large amount of data that we're generating in every research field. Uh, and one is the format. Um, I say so many times from now that um, historically, which is totally understandable, historically, the satellite data is being stored uh, kind of one image at a time. Right, and that um, accounts for how it, it. I mean, every satellite lasts a certain amount of time, which is not very long, um, and it what it looks is at the images. So it makes sense, and it makes sense that it, they are safe in that way because we don't want a gigantic file that nobody can open or download, or or you know, there's not enough memory to hold it anywhere. So it makes sense. Uh, however, for for time series, it's very complicated to deal with that and it generates unnecessary input and output um, challenges. So now there are new ways in, um, that we can deal with the data. Um, one of those propositions is from um, a data type called STAR, which what it does is really just divide the data in chunks. And instead of the user having to go and look for each file on its own or each of these chunks, it kind of just makes a map where everything is and that's what the, the user um, access and then it's been able to just say like okay I want all this data along this axis and this library goes and look for the data whatever it is because it has a map of it. So it's a very convenient way it works for excuse me for storing the data as images but also um, to extract time series so really you get whatever access you need to However, there has a disadvantage of a storage. And this is where the second uh, challenge comes from because people have a lot of scripts already from you uh, using time series, right? A different way to do it. And so if you want to change it into this data type or new data type, you have to put all the data, which is uh, gigabytes and gigabytes of data somewhere stored as well. And that is doubling at least the cost of st storing your data and having access to it. So it is a, it is a challenge more on a logistical way, uh, but luckily there are uh, clever people that are trying to figure out how to do this without having to change the actual files, right? Kind of a pretend SAR format and to be able to access the data in different ways. Um, this is still in the works, but um, um, I hope there is hope. <laughs> Uh, the second, or the last one, sorry, is the availability of the data. Um, more and more data has been migrated, but um, not all the data is freely available online or in different formats. And that is still a challenge. And sometimes you have to pay for it, but other times it's just behind um, uh, the need of credentials to access the data, which um, coming from a user, as I say, it's not that simple to figure out how to use it, right? Like I even even me that I've been doing this, sometimes I see credentials, I see how you have to use the credentials and I'm like, oh boy, this is too complicated. I'm just gonna find another way to do it, right? So the accessibility um, and availability of the data is still not 100% there. And um, even further, one thing that I, I think is a little bit scary is that a lot of the data is, is a schedule uh, to face or is phase out to be in the cloud only. 
like the idea is that you don't have it redundantly in an online server on site and in the cloud. So eventually everything will be in the cloud. And a lot of the feedback that I, I get from my field and people that I work with, but also the people that I taught this tutorial to is that we don't know what we're going to do when it's not online because we have not mastered how to get it from the cloud. It's still very challenging and there's a lot of scare about, are we gonna be able to access the data the same way or with the, the easiness that we used to do it. Um, so those are the, the, the challenges in data, but now the software, it's it's a different, um, a different matter. Uh, there are new coding languages, as I say, I think uh, Python is a very good, um, a very good um, programming language because it involves um, a lot of intuitiveness and, and uh, features from other languages that make that very easy. And in particular, it has this X-Ray um, library uh, that allows it to work with these files in a very, very easy way. And then has other libraries like Dask that allow to work with very big files of data in a more efficient, efficient way. So there's, there is, there are the tools out there. However, um, because they're still, they're not new, but it's still changing. There's a lot of updates and versions that uh, for a non-expert is very difficult to keep up with, right? All of a sudden your things do not work anymore and you have to update, but that changes something else and there's conflicts, you have to update everything, et cetera, et cetera. I think we all been there. And for people that are more comfortable with computing, this is an usual problem, but, um, but not for non-experts, in my opinion. Uh, so that's part of the availability and stability of tools. Uh, sometimes it's very, um, um, there's a, only a one way to do it or, or the most common way to access one command or one library, but sometimes there's a lot. If you Google it, um, you can get many, many, many different answers and you don't know where to start if you're not an expert, right? And you can be doing things in too many different libraries. Like you can be using Pandas and X-Ray at the same time and not even realize it because you're just Googling things. Um, and then this interacts with the data in the sense that some of these tools interact with certain type of data in one way but if the data is in a different format or in a different place, it interacts in a different way. You need to use different libraries, different commands, different functions. And that gets very complicated if you are a non-expert because you have to learn so many different new ways to do things. And that usually is not very, um, well, time efficient if your research is in another, in another field. Um, and finally, well, you do need some, some coding expertise. As I say, sometimes it's not just the, the knowing the programming language. However, um, it's about the concepts, right? Like, like when you are a coder, you have this abstraction and this knowledge that allows you to navigate more and more easily new things. But when you do not, um, you're not fluent in coding or computing, it's more and more challenging to acquire new language. Hey, um, there is a question for you. Yes, I'm, I'm reading it. That's why I'm pausing. <laughs> um, thank you, Ozzy. Um, Valentina asks, some of the data collection in the cloud seems to be managed by Farallon. Uh, what are some of these challenges of managing the data in the cloud? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I don't know how much I can answer since I'm not the one that, um, that does that, um, uh, that maintains the data. Um, but let me say this, uh, one of the challenges that we have is, um, is this what I'm telling you about putting the data in the cloud means paying for another, for the storage. And um, I'm gonna be very specific about this example. Uh, we're hosting the sea surface temperature data from the Muir, set, Muir um, uh, data set, uh, which is high resolution data. So opening and closing one file at a time for a time step, it's absolutely impossible to do. Um, and this is the one that is hosted on the web is um, one, one time step at a time, but in the cloud, it is in SAR format. 
to be able to test this that is way easier and faster to access this for time series in SAR format. And it works. However, to do this, NASA has to pay twice, right? Has to pay to store it in their own service and have to pay to store it in the cloud. But also they are moving or, or, or changing the Muir data set from their service in Pollock to Amazon. And so they don't want to pay twice. And this generates a lot of problems. So uh, Shale Gendeman, who is the one that is um, uh, hosting or maintaining the data set, have managed to keep it in uh, the cloud in SAR format for, for us researchers that one time series. However, because it's not supported, she has to generate the SAR format on her own every certain time. So it's redundant of generating this data set and it takes just a lot of time. And we don't know how long it's gonna be hosted because at some point the funding is gonna run out to keep two versions of it. Um, so right now she is, or she's been very busy trying to figure out this alternative format to be able to read the, the one image at a time format and pretend that it's a SAR format for a time series because that's what we do. So really there is um, a lot of logistics involved in this um, and there's a lot of pushback from people. I think those are the most challenging situations with the data. Uh, that some people want it in one format and some people want it in two formats. And for the administrator point of view, uh, having two or three versions of it, it's just not viable. Um, I don't know if that answered your question. I kind of rumble a little bit. <laughs> um, then uh, putting it all together. I mean, this is, this is where the computing expertise really is, um, it's necessary and I think that we that do this for a living uh, underestimate how much it needs to be, it, like how much expertise we have. Um, because really you, I mean, there's, as I say, there's amazing tools and Binder Online, there are several uh, ways to have cloud environments for free uh, and very accessible and very nice, but unless you know where to look and how to work with them, um, you don't know where to start. Um, and then I remember my first my first uh, meetings about the cloud. I they were talking about it, the Jupyter uh, Jupyter notebooks and the Binder and Pangeo and S3 buckets, and they are just talking and talking. And I'm underneath the desk. I'm googling every term because I have no idea what they're talking about. And I was there as the expert in computing science um, from my group, and so I feel like most new users are going to feel really intimidated or like I don't even know where to start other than googling the definitions of things. Um, so there's need for guidance in this how to use and what to use and what version to use. Um, and then the coding expertise, I say troubleshooting workflow problems are is not easy and um, it comes from years and years of expertise. Right, like it, it's a steep and, and but still long learning curve that most of us have done if you are in computer science, but for a new user it's still challenging. Um, and that's that's something that is not gonna be easy surmounted, but uh, hopefully with more stable versions, it will shorten at least. Um, and I just wanna give you one example of what I went through by doing this um, tutorial. Uh, initially, um, I started using my binder um, and work fine. And so I decided that that will be it and I'm not even gonna look anymore. Uh, but then there was some update in the library to access the data. And suddenly I not did work in the, in the binder. Like I could not get access to the data anymore. And no matter what I try, updating versions of libraries, asking for advice, trying new, uh, functions to access the data, I just couldn't make it work anymore. I, it was like a no access and I don't, I don't, I didn't know how to fix it. Um, therefore, I decided to switch to something that another binder that somebody recommended and that was the Pangeo binder, which was more focused to science. And so it worked really well because they have more updated libraries. It was very good um, and it worked great for a while. 
And then I keep working on my examples and getting the data to work, blah, 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 blah. Eventually, uh, Pangeo decided to switch from the servers that they were using to a different way to do it with more uh, targeted audiences. And then suddenly I didn't know how to access anymore, right? Like the, when I loaded my, my scripts, now it didn't work. And the way that you used to make it work before, it didn't work anymore. I asked them and the response was like, oh no, you should never do that, things that way. And I was like, well, that's how you were doing it like last month. <laughs> and they're like, no, we totally changed. And they sent me to the instructions and they were like a different language to me, right? And so I had to deal with it, but as a new user, that is very discouraging. If I didn't feel the need to complete this project, probably I will have given up by then. Um, so I didn't know what to do anymore. So I decided to try my binder again, just to do small things. And turns out that they upgraded something in their environment and now it worked again. And so um, that back and forth is, is not that easy if you do not feel super comfortable with it, right? Like if those, that's not what you do in the day in and day out. I felt like that, I felt really, really, um, little and, and incapable. So I really needed the help from experts to help me navigate what to use and what alternatives there exist. Um, but again, I mean, it, I don't want to sound like everything was bad. Um, there were many things that were good and the change for good through the time that last year that I've been doing this tutorial. One is the, the access to the data for free. When I proposed this tutorial, not all the data was available, but in particularly the data was not available for free. There were very, very few instances that were available for free. Uh, you had to pay, but they soon realized that that was not going to work. It's complicated. It required uh, or it led to many errors and very, very big um, bills. And so there has been more and more freely available data in the cloud now. So I think that that's, that's a great move. Um, the other, uh, there is new and very clever ways to store data, or as I say, like pretend to be start, pretend chunk data, which promise to uh, facilitate the access to data that is in whatever format, uh, make it a little bit more uh, user friendly. And um, things are changing a lot, which is difficult for users, but they are changing in a good direction. So far, I have not seen anything that, oh my God, now this is just impossible why they did this. No, every change has been very positive. And, um, and the fact that many, many fields have similar challenges with data, there's, there's, there's more opportunities, I think, for collaborative work, but also to find more common grounds, right? Like more common formats to do things which eventually are going to lead to more stable environments. I think that is um, a very good thing that is, is happening. Uh, my wish list is really more standard um, data formats because uh, right now, um, if you go and see the tutorials, there's three different ways to access data. And these are just three examples, but all of them um, have a very different way to access the data. Um, that's one. The other is that we reach some maturity and stability data. I mean, this is just a matter of time, but, um, but I really hope that we get there sooner rather than later, because that's what is one impediment, I think, for new users. And on the other side, I'm having a little bit more time to get there, right, for new users, because learning cloud, cloud computing and how to access data in the cloud is not that easy yet. And so many users are going to need um, more time to get there. Instead of bringing new users abroad, we might be alienating a whole generation of scientists that are going to have a really hard time learning new tricks. Um, so my finally, my takeaway messages, and then I'll take comments and questions, is that um, we are close, but not there yet in the terms of using cloud data and resources. I mean, we're, we're getting there. Um, and that the same with open science, that access to the data is not just availability of data. We have to really make it accessible uh, for people. And that uh, the computer expertise to get this data and to analyze it, it's very, very underestimated. Um, we, we keep saying like, oh, these great tools, but really to learn about them, it takes 
um, a lot of effort and we need to be very aware of it. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and thank you for listening. I'll take questions and comments. All right, thank you, Marisol. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, so I think people, there is one question here in the chat, Marisol, if you can read or I can. Oh yeah, I can read it. Okay. Uh, uh, what about a wish list for tools? You mentioned many great tools in this domain, but are there, are there any types of tools that are missing that will make this type of work easier? Um, you know, that's a very good question. I have really not thought about it too much because I'm still learning X-ray and finding new features that are great. <laughs> and so, um, but one of the tools I think that an access to data that is in different formats will be great. Right, and I think that some of these pretend SARS, maybe they will transform into a tool that you say, I want this time and day in region or this time period and can go and read different formats of files without having to be, um, uh, I don't know, bunches of code that are very specific for some time of data that is saved in certain part. That will be my ideal tool, but, um, other than that, I think that there's, I mean, I'm still learning, so I still have not reached the point that I'm like, oh, I wish this existed. Um, if that answer your uh, your question. Um, I suggest, um, okay, so participants can mute themselves. Mm -hmm. So I suggest then people have questions that they could, they ask directly to Marisol, or if they prefer, they can still write in the chat or in the Google Doc, but please. Don't be shy, unmute, and uh, go from there. Comments are welcome as well. Um, any further questions? Mars, I, I have one more, if, if that's okay. Can you hear me okay? Please, Gilberto, yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, take, thank you, Marisol. This, this was a great presentation. It's great to see all this content uh, put together in, in tutorials like this. This, this is amazing. Um, have, I, I was just going to ask if you have, have, have ever used Google Earth Engine uh, as, as a tool, and how do, you, how do you see interactions between these tools that are running on cloud or cluster environments and a tool like Google Earth Engine that has quite a few resources as well? That's a great question. And interestingly, that's one of the things that is changing a lot. When I started to actually like build the tutorials and getting the data, um, I mean, not that Google Engine was the starting, it was already very well on their way, but it was really focused on images, right? And you can get beautiful images using their engine. But to get time series, it was very difficult because it was not meant to be um, used that way. So that's when I make the decision of only use Amazon Web Services because of the way that data was stored. Um, one year later, um, I'm, I keep hearing that now Google Engine has its own tools to get time series of data. I have not had the time to try it yet, but um, that's kind of my, my next in my to-do list because that would be great. I mean, if it really, um, they made it really easy for the user to get time series, that would be awesome. Um, what I know from people that, that know that there's not a lot of ocean data there, which is surprising because the ocean data is one of the, the, the data that is more conducive to this type of analysis, just because the, the type of data that it is. Um, but apparently they do have, they, they are definitely investing in doing time series analysis. Um, but much more than that, I do not know. Um, Marisol, there are two questions there. The first, does your Python tutorial only relate to Earth Science? Um, yes, I mean, in yes and no, I guess. Um, thank you, Alfred, for that question. That's um, that's a good one. I I it is in the sense that the data that is downloading it's only earth science data. Um, but one, the introductory uh, chapters, yeah, they are just Python and X-ray. So it's 
really not focus on anything uh, particularly like, or exclusive to our data. Um, and for the time moment, yes, because I need to go somewhere and I or, or do something and generalizing is hard as like I've been talking and, and you can see from the tutorials data. Um, however, this can really be applied somewhere else. And my idea is that you could take any of these examples and adapt it to the type of data that you're using. They shouldn't be um, more challenges into translated into a different field than is just changing the, like let's say from sea surface temperature to salinity, it's gonna be a different type of data and there's gonna be challenges in changing that because as I say, there's still not a standard format. So it should be more or less the same amount of challenge into change to another field. Um, but obviously I can only talk about what I know, which is our data. Okay, and Ben has a question. Um, once you get the data, Marcel, what is the biggest challenge here in terms of, I think, computing? Managing the data size, for example, need enough RAM in the system, or is it fetching and feeding the data to keep the system busy? You know, that's, that's a great question, man, because once you get the data, um, and if it's in a, in a format that is uh, in the cloud, you actually do not have a lot of, a lot of um, challenges anymore. Uh, because one way, one thing that I didn't mention, but, um, but uh, those having your data in the cloud and in particularly in formats like SAR, is that you open, open the, the map of the data and you say, um, I want this area and this period, and you can use an X-ray, you can already do some manipulation. Like let's say I want a mean, like monthly means, or I want a special mean, or I want something, do that calculation first and then give me the result, right? I don't get the data until that is done if I want to. So I don't have, a lot of data to store. I just get the data that I selected and maybe manipulate it. So that makes it super easy once you get it to save it. You don't need a lot of space unless you want global, a lot of data, um, but it's very easy to manipulate afterwards um, using X-ray. So I really think that the, the biggest challenge is into getting the data. Uh, the rest, and, uh, and this is something that, um, that I noticed in the tutorials, the rest is relatively easy. And if you go to tutorials, like there's this much of acquiring the data, right? And then there is like an analysis that in reality is, is very little. And to me, it was like an anti-climax because I'm like, now my analysis so, looks super simple and not important, <laughs> but really um, that's a reality of thing that the acquiring the data was the hard part. The rest is, it's very easy using X-ray. All right, so let's see here. Any further questions? Questions from the uh, participants? Um, I think Ben, thank you, Ben. Ben was happy with the, oh, there is one here. Ben was happy with the, your answer. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, Sandra has a question here. It's a long one, I think. Documenting <clears throat> your experiences through the tutorial, you built on the tutorial built on this presentation helps others understand the challenges you encountered and the solutions you successfully pursued. I hope the computer science challenges can be reduced so that your science can be better supported and let you make significant advances in your discipline. Best wishes for future success and more publications. I enjoyed your presentation. Oh, sorry, I thought it was a question. It was a, a comment. <laughs> she, yeah, she was thank happy. You, Sandra. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sandra. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you, Sandra. Uh, any further questions? So again, if any, uh, you can unmute, your, uh, unmute and ask directly to Marisol. If not, uh, I'll just quickly share my final slide here. Uh, 
take the opportunity to announce. Thank you all. Thank you, Marisol. I'll just announce the next um, webinar in the series, which is going to be a little more than a, a month from today. Uh, normalizing inclusion by embracing difference. And uh, it's going to be presented by Marianne Leong from the Sustainable Horizons Institute. And uh, for those interested, you can already go uh, that um, page and register. I have um, actually pasted this address already in the chat. Uh, then I'll stop my sharing again. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, hope to see you next month. Bye now. Thank you, everybody.